thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, really, we were here last year, and uh, we were here talking about Three Aces, and uh, which is a wonderful project and has not gone away, but I'm going to spend my, my time today speaking about Bury Creek because something wonderful happened for Golden Predator at a very fortunate time when the Yukon government uh, confirmed the validity of our quartz mining license and our water license at Bury Creek. And that was on July 1st. It was a wonderful Canada Day gift. And it changed our reality dramatically because we see a market where the companies that have uh, a means to production or production are going to be the ones that benefit first. And what I hope that I can convey to you today in eight minutes and 51 seconds remaining um, are the ways that Golden Predator is trying to minimize and de-risk the project for the benefit of our shareholders. And those would be economic, environment, social, and operational. So as I walk through, um, we will uh, address those topics. I'm trying to find the button. So first slide is don't believe a word I say. Our mandate now is to get the Bury Creek project back into production. The mining license and the water license allows us to restart what is a previously operating gold mine where they left it temporarily closed for a timely restart. Um, the, um, the slide that you're seeing here shows the uh, price sensitivities for the internal rate of return uh, based on different gold prices. So 1250 was the base case and runs up to 1600 uh, Canadian with an internal rate of return at that rate um, on the PEA of 45, or 3%, sorry. Uh, we do have a, a PEA on the project. About a $65 million market cap right now, about 40 cents, 41 depending on the day, 156 million shares issued and outstanding. Uh, for full disclosure, I am married to the chair of the board. We are, uh, along with Eric Sprott, the largest shareholders, at just under 10% each. We also have CIBC Private Wealth out of Yorkville in for about 20%. It's a series of high net worth investors, so it doesn't come up as, as uh, an insider reporting for one. Uh, Pat DiCapo and Power One, McEwen Mining, and uh, Albert Friedberg was also in. One of the ways we're trying to de-risk our projects is by being very progressive in our community relations and our strong relationship with the Trondekwitch and First Nation. I, I credit to the reason why we have a restart under the existing licenses. We have uh, a socioeconomic agreement with Trondek and a, a very, very strong relationship with them. Recently, our chair and the chief did a, web, a webinar, and I can provide you with that link if you'd like to see it directly from the First Nation. So, Bury Creek, this is an outline of our project. The, uh, I'll go back, maybe. There. Um, you'll see the mining license in the beige, and you'll see the heap in the blue, and that will become important as I walk through this. So, this is a Google Earth map of the Bury Creek project. Um, so the Bury Creek project is about 45 minutes by road from Dawson City. As mentioned, it was a previous producer. They left about 150,000 oxide ounces. There is a sulfide resource, but we don't focus on it. The outline that you're seeing is the mining license where we can mine and the deposits that are located there, as well as the new resources that we've discovered. This will hopefully zoom in on the heap but it's not really working. There it is. So you'll see the infrastructure that's left. This is the ability to start with a very low capex, about 35 million Canadian, uh, sorry, US, will get us back into production um, on a first scale process. And I'll walk through that in, in a minute. So we have a three phase process for Bury Creek. The first phase, we want to reprocess the heat field. They ran run a mine. Uh, it's a 15 million uh, ton pad. There's nine and a half million tons on it. When they ran run a mine, they ran 60% uh, recovery. So there's a significant amount of gold left on the pad. We have the ability to reprocess it and crush it. So you see the heat pad and you see three new cells that have been unbuilt. They're also licensed and you'll see the three ponds that are there and they'll be relined next year. 
So by re reprocessing the heap, we're able to start uh, with a very low capex, and then we use that in order to expand and finish the current mine plan and go through the permitting process so we can expand into new areas that we've discovered. When we picked the project up in 2009, we expanded from about 150,000 ounces to 850,000 ounces of oxide. That's a five-fold increase of our resource in about three years. We're continuing to drill, and we'll be able to uh, look at an updated PEA as well as a feasibility study on the heap in order to restart it. So some of the ways that we're looking at de-risking the project, and I've got a number of slides, but I'm really just going to keep talking about this one. I think it's important. Um, environmentally, 20 years of data. This is a proven project. It was reclaimed extremely well. Infrastructure left in place. So there's a minimized risk from on environmental. Economic, we know what's there. There's 10 years of information on what's on the pad in order to restart, as well as the existing resources in the mining license area uh, that we have and the new discoveries that we've made. Operationally, we're expanding our team to bring in the right people to put this into production. We were an exploration company that has been blessed, so we see the benefit to our shareholders by doing this ourselves on a phased process. So we don't dilute the stock and bring in somebody else that's going to put it into production. And you'll see those new team members being added. And um, on the social side, the relationship with the community and finding ways to keep wealth local. If you're not bringing the community along with you, they really don't have a reason for you to be there. So it's important um, to consider all those risk factors. Uh, another image of the facility when it was operating, those pads are, the, the heap is still there. Presently there's equipment moving uh, dirt in order to be able to reline those, those pads uh, in the spring. Those ponds are still there and they will be relined. And uh, we have about four rigs going this year, two core, uh, two RC, one core, and we have an auger rig on the heap right now. We're uh, doing some drilling in order to determine best crush size for when we crush. And you'll see the ADR plant and the lab that's down there on the image. Uh, those foundations are still there. The engineers are at site right now testing the structure. And this is the way that we have millions of dollars in infrastructure that's left on site in order to put this in to a timely restart. With an eight-year mine life of the current resources and the ability to expand, and a low capex uh, with a very aggressive development project next year. Um, we don't want to make any time commitments, but you know, 18 months is very reasonable to have this back into production. And just some images of the different resources that are there and their proximity to the heap. And again, uh, we still have the three aces and the plant, which is producing some pre-production revenue uh, through our bulk sample. But Brewery Creek is our prime focus, and uh, we hope that uh, you'll see how we're working to de-risk the project and offer a very interesting project in a very safe jurisdiction with the Yukon. Uh, over a gram per ton, uh, there are very few projects that are licensed of this caliber that are proven able to go back into production so quickly. We'll be available after, and I thank you very much for your time, and enjoy your day. Thank you.